Hi, my name is Tim Westcott, and today I'm going to be talking about writing software to implement a PID controller in an embedded system. Now, I want to make it clear that there are a whole bunch of different ways that you can implement a PID controller in software, and, and in fact, just in analog electronics. I am going to be talking about one specific way to do it, and furthermore, I'm going to be making some simplifying assumptions in the writing of this software. I want to write software that clearly communicates the idea of how you make this work. And in order to do that, I'm doing some things that you may not necessarily want to do in a production system. Specifically, I'm only going to be using the C programming language. You can do this job equally well in assembly language or in ADA or in C++. If you have a system that supports real-time operation with something like Java, you can use that. So you're not limited to doing this in C. Furthermore, I am going to be using double precision floating point arithmetic because this is a sort of arithmetic that almost always has sufficient precision to do the job. However, for most of the processors that you might find in an embedded system, particularly in a deeply embedded system where you want to keep the processor cost low, floating, double precision floating point is incredibly costly in terms of its usage of processor clock ticks. It just takes a long time to execute. So it may not be the data type of choice. Now, in a later video, I will do an entire video on choosing data types, why you want to choose data types, how you can write code using different data types that execute faster. But that is a subject for an entire video. Another thing I'm going to do, I'm going to be showing you integrator anti-windup code, but I am going to be using the simplest possible anti-windup code that can be used. Now here again, integrator anti-windup and state anti-windup is a subject of an entirely new video and I will also be doing that. That's on my list of videos to do for you later. And finally, this video only covers writing software to implement a PID controller. It does not cover what a PID controller is. It does not cover how to tune a PID controller. It doesn't cover some of the other control system terms. So if you feel like you've jumped into the middle of things and you're, you're kind of lost, then I encourage you to go back and watch my earlier videos, and that should help you understand what the heck I'm talking about when I do this video. Before we dive into the software itself, I want to show you a block diagram of the control system that we'll be implementing. Now, this block diagram is actually a diagram of the entire system, so before we focus down on the software, I want to look at the whole thing. So, this system has a controller, and depending on how you want to view things, that's either the processor or it's a board with a processor on it, or you might want to think of it as just the software. But that controller is the part of the system that's actually making decisions about control. And that controller gets input from the outside world. It gets commands and it gets input from the sensor, which I'll talk about later, and it sends output to the actuator. Now the actuator is here again, you can be fluid with how you do your definitions. Just be clear if you're writing a document for someone else what you mean. The actuator could be a motor or it could be an amplifier going to a motor or it could be a heater coil or whatever it is that you need to shove the real world around. That's your actuator. And then that actuator feeds into the plant. And the plant can be, it might be your motor, um, if, you have a, if you have a motion control system, it would be the motor. If you are controlling the temperature of something, then that might be a heater or it might be a refrigeration unit. It's the, the plant is, is the thing that's being acted upon. The plant is the thing that, that is being driven to what you want it to do. And then that plant has some desired output. And that desired output is measured by the sensor and the sensor is what takes the motor speed or some position of some mechanism or the temperature of something and it turns it into voltage and thence some number that can be read by the processor 
and then the output of that sensor goes back into the controller. And the controller then takes the output of the sensor, and it takes the commanded value, and it remembers what it's been doing before, and it uses that to compute the next input to the actuator. So it, it, computes, an, it computes a drive value for the actuator, and it sends it out to the actuator, the actuator takes it in, and that closes the loop. And then you have this continuous closed loop process that is implementing your control system. Now at the top level, the code to implement a PID controller, or actually any controller, is quite simple. You read the output from the plant via the sensor, you calculate the new value that you want to drive to the plant, and then you output that through whatever output hardware you have. And in this code, the way I'm showing that is I've got this SPID structure that holds the state of the PID controller and holds the various gains and whatnot. And then I've got an update PID function that takes a copy of this structure and it takes the error between the desired plant output and the commanded input and it takes the actual plant output and it uses those numbers plus the state that's in that SPID structure to compute the desired drive for the plant and then finally it puts that drive out using, you know, by whatever means that is appropriate for this system. So as long as I am able to sample the plant output in a nice, continuous, steady manner, then I can write one of these things and it should work. Now the first element that we're going to compute is the proportional part of the PID controller. This is the simplest part. So all you need to do to compute proportional control is you find the error between the, your desired value and the plan output and you multiply that by some gain and you can see that done mathematically right here and now here's the code for that and you can see that this is almost simplicity itself we're just taking in the error value we're multiplying that error by a gain and that's the return value of our function. We're not adding any other terms to it right now. And as a matter of fact, we're ignoring part of the input to this function because you don't need it for proportional only control. So that's proportional control. Now let's talk about integrator control or integral control. Here's the math for it. Sorry to throw in the summation sign, but uh, if you write software, then you should be able to, to read that and know what it means. Um, integral control ensures zero DC error and the reason it does it is because of the summation sign in there it's always summing up the error it's adding it up and if there's any error that just is persists then the the drive output grows and grows and grows until the thing moves and that error is taken away now that's the good part about integrator control the bad part about integrator control is because it's acting on past values it introduces lag into the system and anytime the system is is slow anytime it's acting on past values then you can get a problem with oscillation so it decreases stability but it gives you dc accuracy so usually overall it's a good thing sometimes you don't want it so you leave it out usually you want it now i i need to talk about i need to introduce a concept in this video that i haven't talked about yet in any other video i'm going to give a short overview of it here and then i'll do a whole video on it later and the concept i want to talk about is integrator wind up the basically what integrator wind up is is that if you have an integrator in your code and if the that integrator is not bounded if the value of that integrator is allowed to just grow as big as it can get then you can get into a situation where the system is pushing towards its goal and it's at maximum drive but the value of the integrator is way higher than the maximum drive that's possible you might have an integrator value that's 10 or even 100 times bigger than the maximum possible drive. So you've got this integrator value that's just way out of line, okay? And you're driving towards your target, and then you get to the target, but the integrator value is huge, and the proportional value can't put the brakes on fast enough, so you overshoot. 
Okay, you overshoot, and, and sometimes you can way overshoot. And after you've overshot, then the integrator value comes back. But the integrator value just goes right through zero, and it goes off the other direction. And now you've got the same situation only pointed the other way. Your system drives back, overshoots the target again, and you can actually get a steady oscillation where the thing is just going back and forth and back and forth because of integrator windup. So if you're going to put an integrator into a system, always, always, always have some sort of integrator anti-windup. I am going to show you the simplest form of anti-windup here, and then in a later video, I will go into fancier forms of integrator anti-windup, where you might use them and why. But for now, if you're going to write a PID controller, make sure to use integrator anti-windup, and make sure to pay attention to it when you're tuning your integrator. Here's the algorithm for computing integrator control when you're using integrator anti-windup. Now, this looks a lot more complicated. But basically, it's only the part in the middle that looks bad, okay? So you're computing the error as usual. And then what that part in the middle says that as long as your integrator is not bumping into one of its limits, then just make it a normal integrator. So the way you implement an integrator is, is that you take the past value of the integrator and you increment it by your error. And then if that thing exceeds a limit, either high or low, then trim it to the limit. And then finally, send it out. Now I'm introducing two terms here. This Imax and Imin, and these are your, your bounds for the integrator. Here's the math that you would use to determine the values for your integrator maximum and integrator minimum terms. Because of the way I've arranged the integrator gain in the actual code, you need to take it into account here. So basically, take the maximum value output that you're ever going to want to send to the ADC and the minimum value. So say your ADC can take from 0 to 255, then your ADC max would be 255, max out would be 255, and min out would be 0. And then use these equations to calculate the range of the integrator. Now, you may... Some people like, in fact, to limit the range of the integrator. In that case, you can, you can just do what I'm showing here, where you can, you can limit the integrator maximum and minimum to some smaller range. And basically what that does is, is that when you have some large excursion in the system, the integrator bangs into one of those limits. And then until the integrator comes out of that, or until the thing gets, gets close to the target, then it's basically just acting as a proportional derivative control until it gets close, and then the integrator starts working. Every system is different. So what works best for you is a matter of what you're, what you're designing. So this is kind of where the art of control engineering comes in. So for now, just be aware that you have this option, and if you need it, Go ahead and use it. Okay, here's the code that implements an integrator control. And you can see here, I'm taking the error in, and I'm adding it into my integrator state, and then I'm doing my anti-windup stuff. And then, to put it out the door, I'm just taking that integrator state, and I'm multiplying it by the integrator gain, and out it goes. Now this is pure integral control. Implementing proportional integral control is fairly easy if you know how to implement just integral control. It's simply a matter of calculating the proportional part, calculating the integral part, and then adding them together at the end. Here's the math, and now here's the code. This top part of this code, you'll see, looks just exactly like the integral control. It is. It's, it's character for character exact. And then it's only at the end where we compute the output value where you see that we're taking the integral term and the proportional term, and that's what's going to the output. So this is a PI controller at this point. Okay, we've gotten through the proportional integral control. Now here's the math for a PID controller. If you look, you can recognize the proportional part and the integral part into that. And to that, we're adding derivative control. Now, this particular math is just showing simple derivative control, where we're taking the, the discrete difference between 
the sample that we've just taken and the previous sample, and we're, we're calling that de the derivative. And this works in a lot of cases if you don't have to have a very high sampling rate compared to your plant dynamics. And, and so if you want to keep things simple, then you can use this. However, you can have problems with this if you're sampling very fast compared to how your plant reacts. And if you're doing that, then you need to use what's called band-limited derivative. And this is what I'm showing here. Now, I explain band-limited derivative in my video on tuning a PID controller. So you can, you can watch that video, and that gives you kind of an intuitive description of band-limited derivative. Later on, um, I intend this series of videos to encompass enough theory so that I can actually give you a proper mathematical description of what's going on with band-limited derivatives. But that's not happened yet. So maybe by the time you watch this video, I will have that out and you can go look. In the meantime, you can look at my tuning the PID controller and you can get a description there. So this shows how to compute the whole deal. And you'll see if you compare the non-band limited derivative with the band limit derivative that they're similar. But there's some difference mostly having to do with the fact that you're essentially averaging past values of the derivative to get the band limited derivative. So this is the math. And here's the code for implementing a full PID controller. Here again, the top part of this code is just showing you how to implement the integrator part. And then the bottom part of this code shows how I'm implementing the band-limited derivative, and then I'm combining the integrator, proportional, and derivative into one answer. And that comes out, and that's your PID controller. This video shows you how to write the code for a PID controller. And it's really just a part. This video doesn't really live on its own. For more information on the context of where this code comes in, please see my other videos. I have a video on the parts of a PID controller that explain what the proportional, integral, and derivative do. And I have a video on tuning the PID controller that uses code very similar to this and, and shows you how to take a PID controller and a device and tune it using a seat of the pants method that doesn't require math. Um, if you want more depth on this, I have a paper on my website about PID controllers and some people like to watch things on video and some people have to read it. So if you're more of a print person, then you can go to my website and you can read the paper. Finally, if you're a theory kind of person, I have a book out that shows you how to apply control theory to write controllers for embedded systems. And I go into all of this stuff in great detail. Eventually, I help, hope to have the whole book on video, but for now, I'm just doing what I can. So, this is how to tune a PID controller. I hope you enjoyed this video.